Today, I'm on with Julia Mejia. She is a member of Boston City Council and is behind a proposition to form a task force to study the issue of reparations. Councilor Mejia, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for awesome, the opportunity. Awesome. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what led you to draft the uh, proposal on the reparations task force? Actually, you know, it was uh, the people that led me to it. Um, just so that you understand the journey, I was approached by um, Tanisha Sullivan, who is the president of the NAACP here in the city of Boston. Um, a few years ago, had asked me to file a hearing order so that we can learn um, about the impact um, that slavery has had um, in redlining and you know policies and protocols and procedures that have prevented um, Black Americans from prospering here in the city of Boston. And I was like, okay. So I filed the hearing order um, just to really start the conversation, just to kind of get a sense and gauge uh, to what the appetite would be to really start diving into this further. And as a result of the hearing order um, from that conversation, really it was determined that we needed to explore this a little bit further and deeper. Um, and so under uh, the leadership of Dr. Kamara, who, um, is a professor at UMass Boston and worked with then um, Senator Owens, you know, in the eighties around reparations. He came on board to help us uh, craft the ordinance alongside with Yvette Modestine, who at the time um, was a formal national um, reparations commissioner. And so between these two powerhouses and alongside the consultation of um, Tanisha Sullivan, the ordinance was drafted in collaboration um, and then presented onto the council. And we went through a series of community engagement processes. We had a coalition of folks that were working with us on um, shepherding this through the process. And what sort of reaction have you gotten from the community? On uh, which community you're talking about, but I can tell you lots of things that I've had to go through, you know, on the, um, on the white side of the matter, we will. Um, you know, there was a lot of pushback in terms of this happened years ago. Why am we, I'm, I'm going to bring it up? This has, you know, um, race baiting. I'm creating further harm. You know, we've moved on. Why are we going to have this conversation? You know, that sort of narrative. Um, I didn't do it. Why do I have to pay for it? You know, that. Um, and then on the other side of the conversation is, you know, the, the national movement about who um, qualifies for reparations and um, what that looks like. And so for me, it was really important as an Afro-Latina to recognize that my job wasn't to determine the who, it was really to create an opportunity for there to be some sort of formal body that would look into this and let that um, process decide um, what it would be. So um, there's been a lot of conversation nationally, locally, um, around this issue. And so for me, as the lead sponsor of this uh, initiative, it was really important um, for me to remain focused on just creating the space for this to happen. So you said that there's been a national movement and there has, it seems like it's kind of accelerated over the last few years. Uh, St. Louis has just pioneered a similar program to create a reparations task force. California, as I'm sure you know, has one that's been active. They just came back and recommended, and this is tentative, I, I believe, because I think the final report is due next year, but they've recommended a total package worth $569 billion, okay. which would pay out about $233,000. $230,000. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so, so, for, you know, so for Americans, though, because you kind of referenced this, for the people who said, hey, we had no part of this. This happened before I was even born. I wasn't there for slavery. I wasn't there for most of Jim Crow. Why should my tax dollars be used to fund this? What would your response be to people who make that argument? It's not it's not about them. Right. And it's really when you think about repairing the harm, harm, um, you know, reparations could be in a number of different forms, Is you know, in the form of an apology. It's in the form of a fund. Right. There's so many different pathways to what repairing harm looks like. But the fact of the matter is, and the bottom line um, we all know is that when it comes to policies that have been implemented um, as a result of government, whether that be the lack of investments in public education, um, you know, the lack of investments on real economic opportunities in, you know, for black Americans here in the city of Boston, the household um, medium income for a black family is $8 as opposed to 
thousand to a white family. And so there's work to be done here. And there is, if we trace down the history, that regardless of whether or not you were a slave owner, the policies um, that have been put in place and the lack of investments in black communities speak to why we need to repair that harm. And it's really not about individuals um, feeling accountable, but it's really generations and decades of lack of investment in black communities. Yeah, people speak to the hundred years of of government policies after slavery as sort of the basis for a lot of these policies, not necessarily slavery itself. We had redlining that existed. I mean, the the Department of Justice found redlining to still be happening in Philadelphia a year ago and just filed a new lawsuit. Um, We also had uh, race covenants that restricted who could buy a home. Yes. The FHA not only oh would they not, give to, not only would they give not give homes to black people, but also white people who wanted to live next to black people. So, w- what sort of things happened in the Boston area that mm-hmm. you see Let's that would that. you know lead you want to, to want to advance this proposal up in your area where you live? Let's talk about that, right? Um, in certain uh, parts of the city of Boston, there were uh, housing covenants, you know, to buy a house that you could not sell your home to a black person. Those covenants existed in the city of Boston, right? And through fair housing policies and, you know, things that have been implemented to rectify that, those things existed, right? And that is part of the conversation. That was the redlining, you know, the dis- the disinvestment in public education. You know, here in the 70s, there was this whole, if you, anyone follows Boston politics, Um, Everybody knows it's deeply rooted in racial segregation. And so during the busing era, you know, when folks packed up during the white flight, um, they took those dollars with them and disinvested in our public education system, which is why we right now, decades later, have schools that are underperforming and under resourced. Right. All of that is traced to you can say, right, government lack of will and supporting policies that will help black people advance. And so that is government having a role, right? And not supporting the um, economic prosperities of black Americans. So one of the things you're gonna hear if you haven't already is that is is the price tag. And again, we don't really know. One of the things that that I've seen is as far as why certain measures haven't really been advanced so far is because we have people haven't really agreed on what a, an appropriate reparations package looks like. Actually, let's start here. So in your eyes, what would a good reparations package look like? Look like? Are we talking about cutting checks? Are we talking about changing policies? What, what, what would the ideal situation, the ideal outcome be for you? Yeah. So first of all, we can't put a price tag on the trauma. Right. And um, the intergenerational uh, poverty that we have um, forced upon our constituents, right? And that I'm speaking now as a legislator. There is no price tag. There's nothing, no amount can erase the harm that has been caused. This is really about um, looking at this from a number of different perspectives. So yes, there is a financial investment that needs to be made to help people get out of poverty. So what that looks like needs to be determined through the work that we'll do on this commission, right? There are a lot of um, educational uh, higher ed institutions here in the city of Boston, right? Um, That needs to pay up their fair share. I know Harvard, you know, announced, you know, millions of dollars of investment towards, you know, this, but is that enough? No, I need every single institution to open up their pockets, right? Um, And not just in the form of scholarships, investments in the communities that they've been occupying space in, right? I think everyone is going to have to recognize that this is not just about the taxpayers. This is everyone here in the city of Boston that does business here, is investing in what repairing the harm is going to look like. That our healthcare system, you know, we talk about black maternal health, you know, we have black women who are being forced to have C-sections, right? Or are dying at birth, right? That for me is an opportunity to talk about reparations, right? That is an opportunity for us to hold our healthcare institutions accountable. The city, right? And the lack of investments that we made in our public education system Right. How are we going to repair that harm? And then in terms of like the dollar amount for individuals. Right. This is why I'm really excited about having this task force, because we're going to bring on people who are the experts in that 
who are going to study the harm and then help us identify what is appropriate based on that harm here in the city of Boston. But so for me, again, I'm not going to put a price tag on what I believe is to be, you know, the price tag. It's just that that doesn't feel right to me as a legislator. I just want to make sure that I've created a process for that work to be determined by the task force that's going to be leading this and the experts who are going to be doing the commission and the study, excuse me. So it sounds like at this point, it's still basically a fact finding mission to determine yes. the history of what's happening, what should be done, if anything, and what remedies to propose. Yeah. So at this point, just so that everybody knows who's listening into or watching this, I don't know how this is going to be broadcasted, but whatever. I put my makeup on just in case <laughs> is that this is going to be one of those situations is that we just filed and passed the ordinance yesterday unanimously to uh, just kind of like let that be known. Right. And so now the next steps are identifying who are going to be the task force members. Right. What the commission is going to uh, the study, what what are some of the deliverables that we're going to be looking for in that study, conducting the study based on that study, identifying what are the recommendations that we're going to put forth based on what we learn. So, yes, it's fact finding, but it's also an opportunity to identify um, some recommendations that we can pursue here in the city. And for somebody who may not be on board with this topic of rep reparations, what's your 30 second elevator pitch? You know, the city here in, the, in Boston, we it's long overdue for racial reckoning. There's a lot of tension here in the city of Boston, and we have a lot of healing to do. And my hope is that everyone, regardless of whether or not you approve of reparations, it is an it is. And we cannot deny Black people the opportunity to go through this process um, because we are um, denying people the opportunity to heal. And real quick, where can everybody find you and also learn more about I don't want nobody finding me. <laughs> I, I was even worried about talking to you. Um, uh, well, so they can follow me on my social media. Julia for Boston, that's F-O-R Boston. Um, or they can email me at julia.mejia at boston.gov. Um, you got the email. You're really trying to get some hate mail. Well, I already got the hate, though. That's, you know, I'm here for all of it. Because whenever you're trying to make a difference, whenever you're trying to push on systems change, um, people are uncomfortable with that. And that's why I'm really excited about what this moment is, is because we have to sit in that discomfort and own it. 